Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today um, for a webinar on the future of adventure travel, uh, brought to you in partnership with A2A Safaris. I think that um, on behalf of Manila House, this is Bambina Olivares. I'm the Director of Programming, and I'm, I'm very pleased to welcome you all today. And um, I just wanted to say, I know we've all had our travel plans canceled this year because of the pandemic, and um, we're all all starting to think with all the restrictions around the world, will we be able to travel again? But I think travel has been opening up in certain places around the world, but um, there are still restrictions and um, obviously everybody's safety comes first. So we're going to have a nice little discussion about where travel is going, what places we can go to, and what destinations are doing to make people feel safe about, you know, about being able to visit them again. Um, Joining us today are, um, we have uh, four panelists with us today. We have um, Juan Cristobal de Pedregal, who is actually joining us from Barcelona this morning. Hola. And wow. uh, he's uh, with Antarctica 21. And then we have Dave van Smeerdijk from, um, joining us from um, South Africa. How's it? And um, so I think you and, you and uh, Juan Cristobal are more or less in the same time zone. And then we have uh, uh, Dave is from Natural Selections. And we have Jasivan Carvalho, or Jassy, who is in Quito, in Ecuador, and <laughs> way past his bedtime, but he's joining <laughs> us today. Thank you, from Tropic Ecuador. And My the pleasure. one who make everything happen today is uh, Binky Dizon from A to A Safaris, who's basically pioneered the whole travel to all these exotic places he sees. His company, A2A, of which he's co-founder and director, has actually brought so many people from Asia to Africa, and it's expanded beyond Africa to South America and Antarctica, and um, actually other exotic places around the world, including Mexico. I mean, they have a whole program. And of course, we've all, he's, I'm sure his business has been hit by the pandemic, and he'll tell us more about that later. But by way of introduction, let me just tell you that, um, Binky caught the travel bug at a very early age. By the time he was 12, he was already planning trips with his family. He lasted almost 20 years in investment banking, partly because he could work in a different city and in a different country every week. In the 1990s, Binky took a trip to Botswana that changed his life. He loved it so much that he took a sabbatical from banking to work as a volunteer conservationist in Africa. Instead of plotting corporate takeovers then, he released and captured rhinos, trapped a leopard for research, and even skinned a dead zebra. When he went back to the big city, he set up Asia to Africa safaris with Jose Lit Cortez, a fellow banker and kindred spirit, to share the African safari experience with fellow Asian travelers. A to A Safaris has been operating for 17 years and currently has offices in Hong Kong, Singapore, Manila, New York, and Cape Town. In 2019, Binky was nominated for the inaugural Grow Africa Innovation Award at the prestigious We Are Africa Travel Conference in Cape Town. The Grow Africa Innovation Award is given to the person that has made a significant impact in developing and growing the African ecotourism market. And Binky very much deserved this award. So I hand it over to you now. Binky will introduce our, our speakers. Thank you, Binky. Oh, and it's World Rhino Day, am I right? Or is yes, that's right. So very apropos. Yes. <laughs> Thanks a lot for that, Bambina. Uh, I'd like to uh, thank Manila Bambina and Manila House for inviting us to join this uh, host, this co-host, this webinar today. I'd also like to mention I'm a, a proud member of Manila House, and you know, for all of the members who are listening in, you know, I would uh, encourage you to pay. For those who haven't paid your fees yet for this year, please do so, as I've done. So we'd like to continue to see our club uh, going forward for this year and next year. Uh, okay, so I'd like to uh, just quickly say how uh, introduce our uh, co-panelists here. No? Uh, just by way of introduction, uh, these three companies are close partners of uh, A2A Safaris. And we've selected, we've worked with them for many years and we've chosen them because we, you know, we believe they are sort of the best of breed in, in their respective uh, industries and countries. No? And that's what we really strive uh, to, to put together for our clients and, and introduce them and work with these really first-rate firms. No? 
Uh, so our first panelist is Juan Cristobal Tel Pedregal, who is the Commercial Director of Antarctica 21 and is based in Barcelona, Spain. Antarctica 21 pioneered the air cruise expeditions to Antarctica, and they offer the most extensive suite of Antarctic air cruises in the world. Juan Cristobal was originally from Santiago, Chile, and he's worked in uh, Torres del Paine National Park in Chilean Patagonia, initially as a guide, then later on uh, as an operations manager for a luxury lodge. Uh, it was there that he developed his passion for uh, ecotourism as well as uh, photography. Uh, and during that time, he has traveled extensively all over uh, South America and managed to visit Antarctica for the first time. After that visit, uh, Juan Cristobal joined Antarctica 21, initially in their sales department, and then later on became head of their commercial uh, department as commercial director and responsible for their, their company's global sales. So that's Juan Cristobal. Our second panelist is Dave Van Smeerdick, who is the co-founder of Natural Selection and is based in Cape Town, South Africa. Uh, Natural Selection is a collection of owner-operated safari camps and mobile safaris uh, with operations in Botswana, Namibia, and South Africa. Uh, Dave is originally from Australia, but he's had over 30 years of experience in the African safari industry. Uh, he also initially started out as a guide and then as a manager and then eventually made move up to director. Uh, Dave spent most of his career with wilderness safaris in uh, Botswana and Namibia in various capacities, uh, eventually becoming sales and marketing director for the entire group. Uh, in 2015, Dave co-founded Natural Selections uh, with the idea that to recreate a safari business that harked back to the early days of Africa in the bush centered around uh, conservation. And our third speaker for today uh, is Jassy, Jassy Van Jassy Carvalho the owner of Tropic, uh, Tropic Ecuador, and he's based in Quito in Ecuador. Uh, Tropic is a leading uh, ecotourism company that operates eco lodges and outfits expedition in oral areas of Ecuador, including the Galapagos, the Amazon, the Andes, and the cloud forest. Jassy is an innovative social entrepreneur in social and cultural adventure tourism and he's a pioneer in indigenous community-based tourism in the Amazon and the Galapagos. He's also the founder and owner of Ecuador Sustainable Tourism Incubator and Network, Waponi, and eco lodges like Chilcabamba Mountain Lodge. Uh, during his uh, tenure at Tropic, he has worked with the Amazon's Warani people to create an award-winning eco lodge, providing the indigenous community with means to preserve their homes and way of life. Um, okay, so that is a quick introduction to our panelists. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to our first uh, speaker, Juan Cristobal from Antarctica 21. Uh, okay, well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you for the introduction, uh, Binky. Um, it has been a long, long um, way to to reach antarctica 21 so i'm gonna go and telling you the best way to go to antarctica um the company is a company who started in 2003 we launched uh, for the first time this idea of combining an air or, or a plane with a cruise in antarctica it hasn't been done uh, so we we did it from from punta arenas we now have been doing this for 17 years uh, this company is uh, absolutely Chilean company. Owners are from Punta Arenas. Um, Punta Arenas is where the headquarter is located. Uh, it, is a, it is a director uh, manager there, Jaime, who, who put this idea together and then uh, they delivered the first trip in 2003. I joined the company in 2009 uh, and since, since then we have been pioneering this, uh, this way to, to, to go to Antarctica. So what we basically did, uh, it, we brought uh, innovation and evolution to the Antarctic tourism. As you know, most, most of the cruise ships start in Ushuaia in Argentina, 
and they need to cross the Great Passage to reach the uh, Antarctic Peninsula. Uh, the Antarctic Peninsula, it is this little area here in the Antarctica, which is the closest area of the South American continent. If you, just for your information from South, Amer from South Africa or from Australia, the distances are around 3,500 kilometers. From, from Ushuaia or Punta Arena, it is only 1,000. So that's why South America is the door to go uh, to and, and reach uh, Antarctica, Antarctic Peninsula. So what we do basically, as the, the name is, is air cruises, which means that we fly from Punta Arenas in Chile, we reach South Shetland Islands where freight station is located. There, there is one of our vessel waiting for us. We're gonna board the vessel. We're gonna cruise all along the Antarctic Peninsula until around a place called Vernatsky Island and then we're gonna go back to freight station and fly back to Punta Arenas. So if you think that from uh, Ushuaia in Argentina, you need to cross the Great Passage in two days to reach the peninsula or to reach the north part of the peninsula and from there starting your cruise, we take only two hours flight. So the difference in time is uh, is, uh, is a big difference. Uh, you save time, but the most important is the comfort because it's known, it's well known that crossing the Great Passage at 80% of the time, is the sea is very rough and uh, that brings uh, discomfort and, um, and possible other problems. Um, so knowing that you need to do it two times, in general, it's four days against four hours flight, so that gives you speed and of course safety. Um, when, when you take the option of, uh, of flying to Antarctica, you still have time to discover other places in, in South America. It could be Chile, it could be Argentina, it could be Ecuador, but you can combine because you are saving time. Uh, we have three vessels. The first vessel is called Ocean Nova. Ocean Nova is uh, a vessel who has been built in Denmark in 1992. It is, uh, it is the expedition vessel today uh, sailing in Antarctica. It, it has uh, the highest uh, ice class because this vessel has a double hull uh, in accommodation, it's simple accommodation. But uh, if I need to compare with a car, is the Land Rover uh, Defender of Antarctica, okay? Then we use a, a luxury yacht uh, called Ebridian Sky. Uh, this vessel is, um, is more, uh, as I said, luxury, but the luxury in the sense is more classic, more wood inside. It's bigger than Ocean Nova. We have ca uh, cabins with uh, balconies. Um, and it is uh, in a way a soft experience or a soft adventure in Antarctica when Ocean Nova, it's a little bit more, um, uh, Ocean Nova can go to places where Hebridean Sky cannot go. And then we have uh, the magic of the two uh, vessels, Ocean Nova and Hebridean Sky are combined in our own vessel. This vessel, we built it and it was, her, her first season was uh, 1920, last season. Um, it's a luxury vessel, it's called Magellan Explorer. It's only for 70 passengers. All cabins have balconies and it's a super powerful vessel. She really can go everywhere she wants. Uh, we have put all the, all the strength of uh, Ocean Nova, all the class of uh, Hebridean Sky together and we have built uh, this vessel. Um, so, it is more luxury. This is a penthouse cabin, for example. We have eight cabin categories. In average, they have uh, 30 square meters, uh, all with balconies, as I said. Um, this is the lounge. Mm, we have a very luxury lounge. The idea of when we conceived this vessel was to bring Antarctica to the inside of the vessel and not just leave it outside as a uh, 
as a cold continent. We wanted to have it inside. We want to have Antarctica all around the vessel, including the room, the, the dining room. So it's a very uh, open vessel to to go to to Antarctica. So and this is the quite of the start of the of the of the company. This is our, our the aircraft. So it's um, aircraft that they are built in the UK. They are conceived for short runways. The runways they are based in mountains or deserts and of course in Antarctica uh, the only runway we have is um, it's uh, it's uh, perfect it's built for this kind of of, uh, of aircraft we have a high wing four turbofans it's a very powerful vessel so you also need to know that only the people who goes inside the uh, aircraft goes inside the vessel so it's a private jet for uh, for us to to arrive to to think your eyes. So uh, we base our operation based on, on on four points. Basically, is that uh, uh, we try to call us the boutique wilderness adventures in Antarctica. Uh, basically, be because we are the only company in Antarctica where the number of passengers it is uh, no more than 70 passengers on board. Even though the vessels are, have a bigger capacity, we only use uh, 70 passengers. We have more space in Zodiac. Uh, we have more space in, in the vessels. The experience that uh, the expedition leaders and staff can give to, to passengers is, is quite high quality. Um, so that's why we, we, we want to use, or we will use in the future, uh, only uh, small ships. Um, so we have the highest ratio in, in terms of expedition staff and, and passengers, which is one to five, one to six, depending, depending on, on the vessel. So uh, this is very important because uh, we don't do groups. Uh, we don't do groups when, when, uh, when going to land. We go all together uh, at the same time to visit a penguin rookery or a scientific station or doing a cruise uh, zodiac um, so that give us and allowed us to be more time in each place we visit compared to probably most of the other uh, operation of operators that because their number is bigger it's more than 100 they need by by regulation by IATA regulation which is the organization who, who who help us to, to operate in Antarctica. Um, they need to do two or three groups and people need to wait on board the vessel and then uh, go and visit uh, any, any place we, we, we can be. So this is important because uh, um, it, is, it, it is what we want and that's why we go to Antarctica. It's to spend time there out there. It's a long way to go down there and, and uh, and it's a beautiful place just to see it from from the vessel. So we try to give, we can we try to give a more sort of like a more quality experience to 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 you to our travels. Okay, so I'm going to show you a few pictures in terms of uh, letting you know how the process is. So we're going to board our jet in Punta Arenas. Uh, it's a private boarding. Um, you you need to understand that Punta Arenas is probably the last city in the world so there is to, to connect Punta Arenas with the capital of Chile or we do it by plane or we need to drive two days from Santiago but uh, via or crossing Argentina so it's quite isolated and and it's a particular city in, in Chile okay this is after boarding I hope it, the video will work with this is important because this is uh, this is landing in Tinker Island. As you see, there is the vessel just in front of the runway, the runway, uh, then the sea. Uh, on the right side, if you see, there is a little house that Chinese wall, uh, uh, Chinese Great Wall uh, Station. There is a South Korean station, Polish, Brazilian, Chilean, Russian station. So. Uh, Honestly, as soon as we board that uh, that plane, the um, the feeling is at least for me was when I started.
starting uh, to go and do camping with my father, I was already in the in the car, and that was that's where the the experience started. So. Um, um, Okay, so this is how it looks from the other side. Then our expedition staff is gonna meet you uh, at the end of the runway with our, we have our own vehicles and, and we are very well prepared for all sorts of weather conditions. And then the expedition starts. We're gonna walk around 20 minutes from the, uh, from the runway to the Zodiac. We're gonna board the vessel, cross uh, the Brantfield Strait, and the next stop is where we do our experience. So zodiac driving, hiking, as you can see, there is space on the zodiac. People can stand up, can, can be a little bit more comfortable and not just like sardines. And then we come back to, um, to, to home with those kind of light experiences. Uh, as you can see, uh, this is, uh, this this walk it's only can be done with a small group of people not with 200 or 300 people because it is too much we have uh, the luck to be in very close to nature and not disturb nature this kind of things happen soon and that's it thank you very much Okay, thank you, Juan. Thanks for that. So uh, I'd like to then pass it off to our, our next uh, speaker, who will be Dave from Natural Selection. Thanks, um, <clears throat> Binky, and thanks, Juan. Okay, Dave. Yeah. Oh, there you go. Okay. Have we got it? Okay, thanks, guys. Um, we, uh, I first um, got to Africa about 30 years ago. I drove a Land Rover from Europe right through Africa. I spent a year traveling around and I never, I never left. Um, I've uh, met my wife here, we've got kids, and we live, we live in Botswana, Namibia, and South Africa, currently in South Africa. Um, so our um, business, we started only about five years ago, but I've been working this very business all my life. Um, and I, I, with a group of um, experienced um, Guys um, and, and my wife, we started this business and we started it um, to, to get all the great things um, which Safaris has to offer, such as great wildlife, um, beautiful open areas. But we also wanted to focus it on um, conservation, on community. We feel that this part of the world is, is very special. It's one of the um, best places to see wildlife and we wanted to ensure that that carries on. Um, and we wanted to do it in a, in a different way where we, um, uh, we, we, we could take people on a variety of different activities. Um, so we don't just do game drives in, uh, in our open vehicles, we do walks, we do uh, balloon rides, we do horse riding, we do um, quad biking, we sleep under the stars. We go to underground hides. Um, we do um, just every uh, canoeing and boating. We do a variety of different ways to get you to experience um, the wildlife um, in a safe and comfortable way. And at the end of the day, come back to a, a comfortable lodge. We've got a variety of lodges um, depending on your, your, um, your style. Um, and then, and then, of course, um, great food and, uh, and great hosting, all with quite in quite small, isolated camps. Our smallest camp has got um, seven rooms, and our and our largest camp has got about twelve rooms. 
the the thing we um, the consolation principle we founded it on was one was the one percent of turnover goes to charity. We we pushed it up to one point five, which is about ten percent of our profits, and it goes to mainly wildlife-based um, and community-based projects around all the areas we work in. So we took that concept from y Yvonne Chenard in, um, from Patagonia and, and, and uh, you know, that's a core part of our business. Uh, we operate in currently in three countries, in Botswana, Namibia and South Africa. And I say we operate because throughout this COVID period, we've had, a, um, we've had to close all our camps, but in June, July, we reopened camps in all three countries. Um, initially, we, we reopened them for just the local people, you know, just the citizens of that country. And we've, we've brought in international standards of, of hygiene um, and, and in our operations. And we haven't had any community um, uh, transmissions in that time. In fact, I was telling the other panelists um, in Botswana where we operate the majority of our camps, we've never had a single case of COVID and, and there's no community transmission. So we've been lucky in that way. South Africa's uh, not, you know, hasn't, hasn't been so lucky, but all three countries we're operating and we're operating um, successfully during this period. All three are um, becoming um, more open now and we hope to be able to host some international guests soon. So we operate, um, as uh, Binky was saying, um, in Southern Africa, and here in Botswana is really the center of great wildlife in Africa. It's got the most elephants in all of Africa. Uh, and, and, um, and, and you can see most of the, you know, sort of famous animals that you, you'd want to see, rhinos, uh, leopard, lion, cheetah, um, and great herds of zebra, um, wildebeest, buffalo. So, um, so the, the lodges that we operate are down here, Lekavada in um, South Africa, that concentrates mainly on, on whale viewing in winter. In Namibia, we've got Itosha Pan, Skeleton Coast. We've got a beautiful lodge called Shipwreck, which we opened a couple of years ago, right on the Skeleton Coast. Desert adapted animals, um, megafauna such as giraffe, uh, uh, elephant and rhino in this area. And then we've got the famous dunes of Sosus Flay in the, in the south. And in Botswana, we've got the Okavanga Delta, which is, a, which is a river that runs right from Angola right into the Kalahari Desert. And it bands out into a myriad of um, sort of palm fringed islands. And, and that's just probably the most quality game viewing area in the whole of uh, Africa. It's got s a s very small lodges and private concessions. So very small footprint there. And then right down to the Makarakari Pans, where we've, we've got the famous Jack's Camp. We bought into this business. Um, it's one of the oldest, if not the oldest, safari companies in Africa. So it does um, tours on the on the Makarakari. And of course, it's all the wildlife and scenery, but it's also got one of the most interesting areas of artifacts in the whole of um, Africa. In fact, recently they found early the earliest case of hominid lived actually on the shores of Makarakari, right where our camp is. And you can literally walk around and pick up artifacts, stone tools, thousands of them. So that's a really interesting spot. Okay, so um, we've, we've taken the COVID period, um, uh, you know, we've had to lock down like everyone else, but uh, we've actually got six new products we're opening in the next um, two years. We've got new camps in, in, uh, in Botswana, we've got Angola and Namibia, we've got an Angola flying safari that we, we're um, pioneering uh, right up to the source of the Okavango. We've got We've rebuilt Jack's camp this year in the Makarakari. And then in 22, we're opening uh, a camp in the Lianti and also um, we, we're starting to build one of three lodges in Madagascar. So we've got a lot of good stuff coming up for you folks that have, uh, you know, want to plan far ahead. Um, as I said, um, we've been operating um, throughout this COVID period. And one of the, I guess, um, uh, things you can consider is if you're in a group is taking out the whole lodge yourself because our lodges are small so you can take four seven um, ten rooms and just block it off and in fact that's what a lot of our guests have done now um, and that makes them feel a little bit more comfort that they're not sharing the space with people that they don't know so these are some of the areas that we operate 
um, up in the top of the panhandle in the Okavango, a little bit like the Pantanal down where um, in, in Brazil. And here's the, the, the Namib Desert um, in, in, South, in, in Namibia. And you've got these beautiful clay castles up in the, uh, in the skeleton coast of Namibia. We've got whales, a migration of uh, whales down there. Um, we don't do the, 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 the boat-based trips like, like one. We do the um, land-based uh, viewing. And then we've got migrations of various animals. These are the zebra migration that go down the Makatakati in the winter. As I said, private concessions, wherever we go, um, you're really out on your own. So it, it, it's, a, it's, it's a case of, um, you know, the you can take a private vehicle if you don't want to share with people, but it's a very big open space. This is a typical, typical sightings that you'll see in the area. This is all Botswana shots. And then Namibia, um, mostly Namibia shots here, big open spaces. This is a, a brown hyena, which is a very rare, um, rarely sighted uh, uh, carnivore on the skeleton coast. Um, different type of products that we, uh, we offer from a basic tented camp. This is sand camp in the, in the Makatakati. This is our uh, newly built Lekavada Lodge, which, which overlooks this, um, this bay with the whales. Um, and it's only got seven rooms. So this one has been really sold. This is actually sold out to, towards, uh, for the rest of the year on an exclusive basis for guests. And then we've got this type of product, which is our typical uh, Okavango. This is called Sable Alley. Um, mostly you're dining outside. It's, it's quite warm and it's very pleasant. So you actually not much inside at all in our, uh, the way we operate. Um, different types of accommodation here from a basic little hut. This is about $100 a night to this one, um, which is about $1,500 a night um, and different tented accommodation. You can see it's all open. It's all very uh, socially distanced. It's, you know, each room is probably 50 to, 50 to 75 meters um, from the main area and a good sort of 20 meters apart. Okay, and I think that's all we've got for you. Uh, just a couple more images um, sleeping out here under the stars. And yeah, just the variety of activities, uh, as, as I said. Okay, um, that's all from my side. Okay, th thank you. Thanks for that, Dave. Uh, and then for our uh, final speaker, we'd like to hand it over to Jassy from, uh, from Tropic Ecuador. Dave, I think you have to unshare your screen. Yeah. Okay, not sure how to do that now. There you go. Right. Just one second. Awesome. I think I'm set, right, Victor? Yep. You're good. Well, uh, Bambina and the Manila House, thank you very much for hosting us and Victor for, for inviting us to participate in the very kind intro. Um, you know, it's been, it's been a, an interesting period of, of our lives, I guess. For all of us, we've been dealing with this pandemic in different ways. And I'm very honored to be here representing Ecuador and sharing a little bit of my story. Incredible experiences and destinations we just, we just saw and I'm gonna share some of, of my own experiences in Ecuador, which is a very, very small uh, country in South America, but has the beauty of, of resuming what South America is all about. It's a mega diverse destination and is an incredible cultural and, and natural uh, destination to experience uh, our small country. My, my journey in, in travel began on a very different way. Nowadays, I own a, a small boutique uh, ecotourism operator called Tropic, as, as Victor said. I also own a few, a few properties across this, this small country. Um, but it didn't begin as, as a tourism uh, entrepreneur at all. 
it began more as a as a as someone who wanted to work with remote indigenous communities and try and find ways to support their struggles to sustain their lifestyle without compromising their their cultural uh, heritage as well as their territories. You know, in, in remote areas in our country, uh, these communities are very exposed to extractive industries like the oil industry in the Amazon rainforest. So we decided to create a conservation initiative that was supported and powered by ecotourism, like the, like uh, what Dave is doing in Africa. So which is which has been an interesting ride. It's been an amazing thing. And I, and I had the honor to, to live with some of these indigenous communities for many years and learn how to share their lifestyle in a respectful uh, manner. So it turned out that we learned how to, to share our destination through the eyes of local communities. And that's pretty much what we've been doing since then. It's, it's 25 years. Nowadays, we're obviously a different type of company. We grew as, as, a, as a, you know, a proper tour operator, I would say. Uh, we have offices in, in Ecuador mainland, in Quito, in the capital of Ecuador, where I live. And we have a small office in the Galapagos Islands. Uh, well, that is definitely one of the, the better known destinations of our country and, uh, and, and on a bucket list of many people like Botswana and probably Antarctica now for many. Um, we, we focus on tailor-made and experiential travel. Like I said in the beginning, it was all about the local communities and we are still honoring that part of our DNA. Uh, we, we created this program called May I Introduce You, which is pretty much a network of, of indigenous artists in different corners of the country. And we are nowadays facilitating uh, interaction with these local people. I think that, that the best way to know our destinations is, is to see and experience through the eyes of the locals, like I said. So we are creating all of these different sorts of workshops with, with textile, uh, makers and painters and, and families opening their homes to us, uh, doing cooking classes. So that's a fundamental part of, of what we do here. And obviously we have some urban adventures nowadays, uh, very focused on exclusive experiences in like in cities like Quito uh, with, you know, beer tastings and chocolate tastings. Ecuador claims nowadays to have one of the best cacaos in the world. So we're exploring a lot of, of, of chocolate and cacao experiences. Um, I also partner with my brother, Alvaro, right here at Terra. We own a, a small high-end restaurant in the city of Quito. So we're exploring now the, the idea of sharing Ecuador through to different flavors and ingredients, which is an incredible, the gastronomy nowadays is very important for anyone's uh, traveling to a destination. So we are, we are focusing a lot on those senses as well to share with, with our clients from around the world. And you know, I think like like my colleagues said, it's all about exclusive experiences nowadays, especially especially post COVID. I think people will be looking at more more uh, contained, uh, smaller, and exclusive experiences. So we are looking into that sort of you know curated visits to to museums, uh, you know, private art galleries, uh, small cooking classes in, with with chefs, uh, heli rides for people who want to an overview of, of the incredible volcanoes we have around Quito. And, um, and going back to the topic, uh, Bambina, I think adventure travel will be the first to return. I think the intrepid travelers are going to be uh, the first ones uh, venturing out. You know, it's people who had the travel bug and they will be looking at going out. And, 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 and we also believe that family travel will come along with adventure travel. I have been trying uh, with my kids, you know, I've been, I never been so much time stuck in, in Ecuador like this period of time. So I'm, I'm, I'm making the most of, of, of my kids and, and the beautiful re regions that we, that we have in this country to, to explore. And I think that families will, are very accustomed now to be together and they're looking forward to go out together now and explore new, new places. So we've been doing and exploring different things like, you know, snorkeling classes with, with my kids in the Galapagos Islands and, and the same sort of uh, cultural interaction for, for the little ones and hikes in the cloud, cloud forests and obviously properties that are, that are in tune for the little ones as well, you know, bird watching lessons and, and obviously a lot of wildlife in the Galapagos Islands. We also believe going back to the adventure travel component is that active is going to be of interest. I think people have been enough time in their homes and they will now be very interested to be in the outdoors. So we are adapting all of our different experiences, including in the cities to, to allow people to go, to go out and go for hikes around the cities and horseback ridings uh, in the surrounding of Quito, for example, in the Andes, 
is very popular. Rafting in the Amazon rainforest, uh, standard paddling in the Galapagos, snorkeling, diving, of course, is 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 definitely on. Um, and one of the beautiful things about our country, like I said, is the diversity, right? We have Cotopaxi, which is the highest active volcano in the world. Um, I have the, the, the honor to own a property that overlooks the volcano, like you're seeing there, Chilcabamba, which is, uh, it's, been, it's been a place that we've been spending a lot of our time because it's so close to Quito, it's an hour, 15 minutes drive from my home, so we spend the weekends there. Well, now, uh, like Dave said, we're very lucky to, to be fully booked with locals as well. We explore that domestic uh, component of our business that we never explored before. And we've been very surprised that even locals are desperate to go out and have adventures and fun. So uh, Cotopaxi, you know, High Andes, Otavalo, which is north of Ecuador, very, is a very cultural and, and indigenous region. So we are obviously spending a lot of time trying to incorporate as many cultural experiences that, that we possibly can on this specific region, the cloud forest, which is a very unique ecosystem where the high altitude, the cold of the high altitude and the heat from the lowlands of Ecuador meet and create this very special ecosystem with incredible top end lodges, uh, unique uh, National Geographic unique lodges of the world uh, like Mashpee Lodge. But you know, it's, it's all about the wildlife, bird watchers paradise for sure is this specific region, very close to Quito as well. We're talking about a couple of hours drive to Otavalo, Cotopaxi, or the Cloud Forest. So it's very easy to move around uh, over landing. The Pacific Coast that, ha that is having now, it it's not very known for the international uh, visitors, but you know, it's, it's again, it's a place where you can also see some, do, do some whale watching, but the, a lot of beautiful small boutique properties are popping up. So. It's great that the private sector is still believing in, in tourism, even though we are probably the most affected industry uh, within this pandemic. So there are new little properties popping up, uh, which is also incredible for, you know, kind of a re relaxing and sun and beach sort of experience after a busy Andean and cloud forest and Galapagos adventure. And obviously the Amazon rainforest, Ecuador, we're talking about uh, the interest to go to the Galapagos and experience wildlife. So a, a great com uh, combination of, of, the, of the Galapagos will be the Amazon rainforest. We, we have the most accessible Amazon rainforest. This is shared with, with a lot of countries in South America. Brazil is probably the better known for its Amazon, uh, but Ecuador has probably the easiest access of Amazon with beautiful small properties, like I said, in partnership with local communities and, and definitely a very unique uh, uh, ecosystem and, and wildlife. And um, I also believe, you know, that, that there will be a spike in bucket list trip. People will be traveling less, uh, definitely, because they are more concerned about their, their time away and, and the risks of, of going out. But I also think that they're going to be prioritizing those, those dream trips that they always had. I, I have a few now more with Botswana, probably, and Antarctica, but definitely Galapagos is on every every naturalist uh, enthusiast and is definitely going to be uh, very popular uh, next year we are we're actually having a lot of inquiries now for for the holiday season uh, you know the galapagos islands is all about the wildlife and but but mostly uh, darwin's theory of, of evolution and the species the adaptation of species so it is is a natural laboratory of evolution really in a classroom for my kids um, and there are a couple of different ways to explore it, you know, like, like Juan was sharing, you know, his own, the, the vessel experience, Galapagos have, have plenty of choices in terms of small uh, luxury catamarans or more classic uh, uh, sailing boats, uh, medium sized ships. So there is, a, there is a, a lot of choices for people who want to have this kind of romantic experience of sailing the Galapagos like Darwin did. But another very popular new way of traveling in the Galapagos is land-based. Uh, like Dave said, you know, there, there are also those possibilities in the Galapagos. Uh, staying in one like wilderness lodges inspired on probably your own African safari style tented camps, Dave. Uh, we, we have now our share of, of safari camps in the highlands, especially of the islands in the Galapagos. Uh, but instead of zebras and, and elephants, we have giant tortoises cruising cruising by. Also, a few you know luxury luxury lodges in in the in the close to the to the little towns with more family friendly choices with pools and that stuff. So so the good thing is that Ecuador has a lot of, of variety 
uh, for people to explore at their own pace, at their own style. Um, I agree that it's going to be a lot of uh, chartering boats and chartering lodges. We're already having those those sort of inquiries, which is great, you know, for people to have a more sort of a sanitized uh, experience. I, but I believe that Ecuador in general, like my colleagues just shared with their own destinations, we're talking about natural areas. We're talking about wilderness areas, which social distancing is, is, is a usual thing. So we are very used to to, to handle this type of, 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 of adventures. And one unique thing that, uh, that I wanted to share before I, I, I end my presentation is that we're also investing on, on, on new conservation initiatives. I think our governments, especially uh, a poor, poor country like Ecuador, it lacks of funds for the recuperation of this incredible economical impact of the pandemic. And we believe that it's going to be a lot less funds uh, from the pro public sector to invest on conservation and social initiatives. So we decided to, to invest a lot more nowadays. And we are, we have a small lodge in the Galapagos called the Galapagos Magic. And we decided to do our own reforestation and recuperation of the original habitat of the giant tortoises. So that's going to be new and interesting. And, and Binky is going to be sharing with you guys whenever you decide to come to, to Ecuador with us. Um, and that's, uh, you know, pretty much it. I think we're going to talk a little bit about safe travels now on. We were one of the first companies to get to be accredited by the World Travel and Tourism Council on the on these international protocols uh, that includes uh, biosafety around COVID. So I believe we're going to be talking a little bit about our experience in that sense. Um, and we're ready. Right? We are ready to, to share our, our, our beautiful little country uh, with all of the comfort that is required, but also with a lot of adventure. So look forward to, to your questions and, and continue sharing with the panelists here. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Jassy. Thanks to all our panelists. Um, those were great presentations. I'm sure we'll, we're filled with a little bit of wanderlust right now. But um, I'll, before I open the discussion, I'll open the discussion now. But I'd like to start with Binky first, because like I said, Binky is often everyone's first point of call here before you know anyone planning to go to any of these destinations. They A2A has built a reputation of being the specialists for this region. Binky, how has your business been affected by the pandemic? I'm sure you had canceled bookings, especially in the run up to Easter. Yes, um, you know, obviously it has had, you know, a significant negative impact for us. We had a, you know, big uh, number of, you know, people slated to travel for this year. Uh, on the plus side, you know, I, I, I'm very happy to say that, you know, about 98% of our bookings, meaning people supposed to travel in 2020, have decided to postpone their trips to next year. So we've only had about 2% cancellation. And really it's because of quite extraneous circumstances. No? So, you know, we really had a lot of support from our clients. And I think that's also a positive that people, you know, are still planning to travel, albeit, you know, next year. Uh, I think where there's also been, a, unfortunately, a, more of a slowdown is I think new bookings for, you know, new inquiries for travel next year. And I think partly that's because, you know, and I think this is specifically in the Philippine context, because we've been locked down for so long. And I think, you know, it, it sort of paralyzed people. I, I contrast that with, you know, we have operations in other countries, say Singapore and Hong Kong and the U.S., where I think they, the lockdowns and quarantines have been less restrictive. So we've actually seen, we were starting to see a pickup in new inquiries from next year from these other destinations already so i think people are beginning to sort of open their eyes already you know to to next year to start planning for next year okay thanks um you're saying that um your your lodges have opened right a lot of your properties have reopened for business you're accepting new bookings i'm not sure about you juan cristobal in Art antarctica i think you have to unmute Uh, no, yeah, yeah, we we are receiving uh, bookings for for new bookings, but for 21, 22 season. Our seasons are always we call it 21, 22 because they are start in November, mm -hmm. the end of November, and they finish in, in at the end of February. And um, 
Uh, yes, I, I share with, with uh, Victor, uh, most of our partners has been very good and supportive and they have been trying mostly to maintain bookings than to, uh, than to cancel. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'd rather say that 80% of the bookings we had for 2021 are being moving to, to 21, 22. Uh, we still are uh, working hard to operate uh, the, the second part of the, uh, the 2021 season, which is January and February. Uh, there is an organization called IATO, the International Association of Antarctic Tour Operators. Uh, they have a, a committee uh, there to, to, to find ways, because all of us, uh, in a way we do the same, but different, different ways to do it or from different places. So we need to find a way that we, we can all have the same, uh, the same safety protocol, but adapted to each country. So uh, for now it has been hard because we, we did cancel uh, November, December. But um, but people is asking, and 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 this is incredible. And 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 last week, uh, last week we had a fantastic sales week for for a period that you don't expect much. Uh, a Friday with blue numbers from all regions, from all countries. So it was it was really fantastic. We had a, a fantastic group that book. We are receiving inquiries. We are receiving. Even we are receiving charters uh, inquiries. So I, I think uh, I, what I told Victor the other day, um, I think people want to travel and, uh, and, and this is important. And, and I travel myself uh, in a plane uh, a week ago. I went to, to an island here close, in, close to Barcelona and, and I realized that the best way to, 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 to face the future is if it is stupid what I'm going to say, but it's making COVID your best friend because it's there. We cannot from now take it out. And, and, and if I can, if I can, I, I can control my safety in, in 70% when I travel and have my mask and do my gel and wash my hands and not, I'm sure that in a plane or in an airport, I'm not going to be infected. I'm sure, I'm sure. I'm going to be infected if I go to a party with 150 people that I don't know. Mm -hmm. I mean, in, not in an airport, that's for sure. So I think people is changing and, and it's, 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 it's now we have been in this six months. So it, normally we should have a, a sort of a different way to, to approach it because. Uh, oh, but anyway, I, I, we need to stay positive. But I wanted to ask others, how, what else, do you have any queries from prospective clients asking what measures you have in place to keep people safe, to make them feel safe? Because that's very important. Now that's an important component of the business now is, is a safety factor. So how, how do you reassure them? Yeah, so um, as I've been saying from our side, um, we have been operating our lodges over the last few months and um, we've taken um, as uh, Juan was saying um, some international um, safety protocols I think most leading companies in the world I'm sure my two colleagues um, have have, have uh, operated the same way um, you know obviously mask wearing um, hand uh, you know uh, high, uh, just a variety of high, hygienic um, ways that we deal with it the the rooms are, are cleaned and the vehicles are cleaned um, to, to a high level. And, um, but I think we, we are fortunate that we are in the area, we, we're in desert areas and the virus doesn't like the desert. As I was saying, um, we haven't had a single case in Northern Botswana and Namibia, we've had one case per 450 square kilometers, just to give you a, an idea of the scale of that, that would be like Singapore, that would be like two cases in the whole of Singapore throughout this whole year. So, so the virus doesn't like to live in the areas we operate in, which we're extremely fortunate, but we understand people have to come um, through airports and on planes. And so once they get here, we're gonna host them in a similar way they'll be hosted in, in Ecuador and in, 
and in Antarctica to, to a high level of hygiene. So I'm assuming for now there's no quarantine for people coming in, or is it all domestic travel? So um, it, up until now, it's all been domestic travel, but South Africa, Botswana and Namibia are all opening up to international travel. Namibia has no quarantine, but you do have to have a COVID test um, that's, uh, uh, the, 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 that's only 72 hours old. At the moment, that's what they're doing, but these, these, will, these uh, conditions will relax as time goes on. Jassy, did you want to add? Yeah, yeah, but I mean, I, I would say that um, people need reassurance that we know what we're doing, right? And, and, I, and I think, a lot, like with Dave, we, we have been very busy with our little lodge in the, in the Andes, and we learn a great deal of how to handle people's expectations throughout a lot of communication. And then, funny enough, when they get to the lodge, they're so uh, pleased to be in the outdoors and be on a different place that people kind of forget a little bit about the, 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 their fears. And then obviously we have all of the little elements that give people the, the possibility to, to, to do, you know, the rituals of the mask and the cleaning the hands and et cetera. But I think mostly is, is preparing people, letting them know what the, what the rules are to make everybody feel comfortable and safe, like organizing the schedules of meals and et cetera. Um, as a tour operator, we've been working very hard on communicating that to our partners abroad as well. Right? It's a lot about communications. Actually, since March, I think everything that I do on a daily basis is participate on, on panels like these and conversations because we really want people to understand what we're doing as a country, what we're doing as a company uh, to make sure that uh, our clients are safe. We created this, this uh, tropic assistance program. We have partner now with insurance, local insurance companies. We want to make sure that people, because people will be afraid of, you know, what happens if I get sick when I'm in the Galapagos, when I'm in Ecuador. So we have a plan for everything. And that I think is, is creating, you know, the sense of, okay, Ecuador seemed to be ready. We've been reopened for two months. We are already getting a few international travelers coming. And uh, like I said, we're expecting, you know, not a, not a usual busy holiday season, but we are expecting for people to be coming uh, during the holiday season this year. We have like my colleagues here, people inquiring about chartering boats in the Galapagos or renting a villa in the Galapagos or in the Andes. So yeah, it looks promising, it's been rough. You know, we, we won't deny that the tourism industry has been suffering a lot from, from this pandemic for the last six months, but we are resilient, you know, that's probably not the first problem we have had uh, around the, we, we deal with natural disasters and social uh, problems in, in our country. So we're kind of used to adapt our operations to, to strange situations. Like unlike other, other industries, I think we have that spirit of adventure and, and resiliency uh, on our DNAs for sure. But all your trips, all your destinations are, I mean, I'm sure Binky will back me up on this. You're not really for the budget traveler, right? I mean, you can work within a certain budget but there's a certain amount of expense involved in going to the bush, in going to the Galapagos, and going, going to Antarctica. Um, and then you've obviously suffered canceled bookings because of the, the lockdowns and the pandemic. Are you planning to raise your, your, your usual prices to recoup somehow the losses? I mean, will, will people expect a kind of adjustment in your prices? So maybe well, I could just I, I can, start, I, um, sorry. Um, yeah, so, so we've got all the, uh, all the bookings that have transferred from the year before. Um, and I think most, most companies are freezing their, their rates um, for a year. So there's no, there's no increase. And in fact, our, our business, we've got sort of this long stay where if you stay more than five nights, a 20% discount on everything and but i'm not sure about the colleagues but I, I think it's probably the greatest time to travel in the next year or two because you've got great prices and you've got you've got fewer people traveling so um it, it's really a superb time i just want to mention one other thing that jesse said if you don't travel if folks like you don't travel um your 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 members um, there's going to be a big, big burden on private sector to look after the conservation of these areas because the money that people pay for safaris preserves the wildlife and, and all the work we're doing in research 
Um, and so that, that's, that's, really, um, that's really the burden is really sitting with us right now the last year to fund that, um, where it's previously been funded largely by, by private individuals. Yeah, yeah. Same thing here. I, I think Ecuador is, is probably, well, first of all, I think we, we, we launched our 2021 rates in, in a record time, uh, you know, on, on March, the, the end of March, we already had our, our rates available for 2021 travels. And funny enough, they were the same of 2020. And we have so many promotions and specials now available. So I don't, uh, I believe that it's going to be like Dave, I agree. I, I think it's, it's a fantastic opportunity uh, to book now, even if it's traveling, traveling later, what I'm seeing is also a trend of, you know, flexibility. I think never in our industry, and I think it's going to be for a while like that, uh, it's being so flexible, right? The possibility to postpone your trip, you know, we, tour operators and, and, and lodge operators and everybody's trying to make people feel comfortable and not feeling that their, their investment in travel are at risk. So we are working a lot on providing that uh, sense of, uh, security, financial security to, to, to our clients' investments, you know, making deposits uh, less strict and, and facilitating changing of dates at no, no additional costs. So, so I think, yeah, it's, it's, it's actually going to be very interesting for people who, who want to, to secure their 2021 or even 2022 uh, travel dates. Juan, did you want to add to that? Because you uh, were saying you yeah, had no. a fantastic sale, right? Um, not too long ago. Yeah. No, because I, I think um, I think we are. Uh, uh, it's not necessary to say that we are we are all in the same thing and trying to figure out how to deal the best we can. Uh, but I think there is one thing in common, uh, and which is time, and and we all need time, and and. And, and travelers need time to think, to get confident that they can travel. We need time to uh, do our projections, do our promotions and think it very well. So in that base, uh, what basically we are doing is, is to give flexibility based on time. I mean, think about your trip in the next 21, 22 season to Antarctica, book the ship you want. There is space now, you can choose the, the, exactly what you want. And then we, uh, at some point, we're gonna need you to, in a way, commit. Because for me to prepare a trip to Antarctica, at some point, I need your commitment too. So, and and, and that balance is that what we need to we need to we need to find with our travelers and and the way at least we operate. Because uh, to have three ships in Antarctica staff and, and all that requires to have a, a, a super trip there, uh, is, we need a certain commitment. So uh, that time has, uh, has, has more value than, than before because uh, I, I assume that in Galapagos in, and in Africa, people, uh, people buy way in advance. We, we are used to receive bookings with two or even three years in advance. And now that time gets reduced. So um, I don't think we're gonna, well, as, uh, as uh, in Ecuador, uh, we had our, our rates in, in March last year. So, so but um, uh, I think flexibility is the key and flexibility with the time is the key too. So. Mina, if I can just add to that, you know, as you mentioned correctly, yeah, the, the, the trips to these destinations are not inexpensive. I mean, that's that's correct. No, but I think one of the the pluses again of this pandemic is, uh, you know, the rates. Aside from the three companies with us today, most of our other partners have kept their rates uh, either flat or, as I think some of them had mentioned, a lot of companies are uh, now offering a lot of very attractive offers for next year you know? so uh in in that sense there are good you know opportunities or, or promotions to be had you know, if people are willing to commit uh, uh for travel next year and also space is uh you know i think people just i think it's think it's going to be wide open but they don't realize that all the people who were supposed to travel this year essentially moved everything to next year you know? so in theory there's not a lot of open space in these sort of small types of uh, adventurous luxury places for next year, no, because everything got moved. 
So I think that's what we try to are reminding our clients, don't leave it up also to the last minute, no, uh, because you may not, uh, you may be surprised there might not be space next year. But um, yeah. I have a question here from, from um, one of our attendees, from Bernie Aboitis. Thanks, Bernie, for, for joining us today. She says that all these countries are on our bucket list, and Bernie's a very keen traveler. Um, she wants to know what the ideal months are for each trip. If you were to go um, to, you know, your, your particular areas. Well, if, if you, uh, Antarctica mainly uh, operates from mid-November until mid-March. That's, that's the range. Uh, then it's dark, so nobody operates. So we, we only go that, that period or range of time. Uh, then if you ask me which month, uh, it depends a little bit on 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 the interest. Of course, uh, November, December, there is more ice, but uh, wildlife is, is not really present. And, and, and then starting in January, February, March, there is a larger, uh, more um, different types of, of animals around. So in terms of penguins, in December you have the eggs at the beginning, then the chicks, and then the penguins are growing until until February that they leave. But um, I, I think there is no period. The, the, the experience is so enriching. Then, then I've been there eight times and in eight different periods. I mean periods in the sense of, of, of weeks. And each time it has been different and amazing. So but uh, but but the period is mid november mid march okay and is there an age yeah. limit an age requirement minimum age requirement for antarctica uh, uh, yes seven years old okay and it's because you know in the zodiacs when they sit in the in the zodiac then the feet <laughs> you know the feet cannot touch the bottom of the zodiac so it could be a little bit dangerous. oh okay okay yeah but um and Dave, there's also a recommended age for if you're going on safari, right? That generally young children are not encouraged below the age of 12, maybe. So um, that's an interesting thing. We've set up our business to be very family friendly. And I've taken my two kids from the age of three months into the bush. Um, we've got lots of, lots of families traveling with us. And quite often they take out exclusive use if it's a larger family. Um, but we have lodge, we we have some lodges that take um, from from zero uh, onwards, and some that have a, a age limit of six. But to, to answer your question about our time of the year, we operate in the Kalahari and Namib desert. Um, there are rivers running through these deserts, which is how we can operate. But they are all year round. We we keep all our lodges open pretty well all year round. So it just depends whether you like it warmer in summer, like our summer, the Southern Hemisphere summer, or cooler in, the, in, the, in, in, our, um, in, our, in our June, July uh, period. So um, yeah, it's an all year round destination from our side. Jazz? Yeah, awesome. Uh, Dave, funny enough, I took my daughter Alegria when she was three months old to the Galapagos Islands. So. So we have some similarities there. And um, Ecuador as well, is, it, we are year round destination. Obviously there are some changes in terms of, of weather. We don't have the four seasons here. We only have summer that is dry and winter that is wet, wet, not that is rainy. Um, I would say that talking about the Galapagos Bernie, uh, I think that the only two months there, the, the seas are rough and the water might be too cold. Uh, is September and October. That's that's kind of the, the the low season of the Galapagos when most of the boats go on dry docks and maintenance. But in general, it's you know it's a fantastic. I, I agree with Juan that you know wildlife behavior changes depending on the time of, of on, on especially the the temperature of the water. So with the cooler waters, the the underwater world is is a lot more active. So that's a lot of fun for the divers. Uh, my favorite months are April and May because there's a sort of a springtime because it's not so hot, but it's still sunny. So you can still enjoy the sunshine and, and the wildlife. Well, it's obviously always there in the Galapagos, but, but uh, so yeah, that would, that would be my, my only recommendations to think about September and October as 
uh, months that will be uh, a lot cooler compared to the others. Uh, cooler Ecuador standard, right? So it's, it's always really warm down here. <laughs> you're you're on, the, on, on the equator, obviously, right? Yeah. 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 Um, Dave, I just wanted to ask you, going back to the children in the, in the bush, um, you went and you took your children at that young age, it was with predators? Yes, so, you know, the, the areas that we operate have got, uh, they've got, you know, all the predators, lion, leopard, cheetah, they have elephants, buffalo. Um, you know, the guides are used to taking, um, the, this, Africa is really the center of I guess the longest natural history tourism experience in the world. And there's thousands of, of uh, many thousands of qualified um, great guides. I mean, I was a guide too. Um, and I, uh, it, 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 it isn't, um, you know, taking kids into the bush is one of the most coolest experience because you kind of live vicariously through them as, as Jesse was saying. He, you take these little kids and, and their wonderment and their, um, their, their, their enjoyment of, of seeing big mammals for the first time or big reptiles or being underwater uh, and, ex and experiencing with it. You experience it yourself again and again. Um, but we do have strict safety protocols with, with kids. You do have to keep an eye on them. Generally speaking, in a wildlife area, under six is... Um, is not is not recommended unless you take the private use of the camp and we have extra resources to look after the little kids but uh it's one of the most coolest experiences and strangely enough um i know i know in the philippines um, a lot of families like to travel together with other friends as well and it's one of the coolest and nicest experience because there's no dynamic with you know because your family you you live with every day it's fun and you go on holiday together with your family and friends it's also it's the best type of experience you could ever have, I think, to, to go on a family trip. But I know, I mean, for a fact that, that like a lot of animals see, like if you're in the Defender, right? You're in the Land Rover Defender, or you're, you're, you're going into the bush and they, animals see you as a unit, right? So if the child yeah. suddenly stands up, then they get, you know, yeah. they get startled and that, that's when they, they can attack. So I think that's the basis of the of the caution with younger children, if you can't control them from getting excited from seeing animals in the wild. Yeah, yeah, the, gu the guides are used to that though, and there's strict, you know, sort of safety protocols that we, um, that we follow. And there's also rules and regulations that everyone's briefed on how to do things. We don't take children walking. We, yeah. we do do Bushman walks with the kids, with the Kalahari Bushmen, but we, we you know, they generally we keep them in a vehicle and in a bigger boat. We don't allow them in smaller canoes. So there are some restrictions with kids and you have to, you have to, I mean, most of our guides have got kids so they understand how to look after them. But, um, you know, it's part of our DNA, taking families on safari. So we do, we, we're used to it and, and we do, uh, we are very careful with the, with, you know, with our activities. Um, I have a question from Eric Nielsen, um, who was just saying that he had just, he lived in Ecuador for five years, Jassy, um, and oh, he's cool. visited the Galapagos. And before the lockdown, he was actually in safari, uh, in, on safari at, in Kruger. So um, what he wants to know is, um, there are still restrictions on global aviation. So how does that affect your, I mean, all, the desire might be there from your clients to travel, but if they can't find the means of travel, how will they get there? So how, how are you affected by that? We are definitely uh, linked to the air industry, right? We really need uh, airline companies to resume their their flights to for us to be able to, to you know, to welcome our guests. But but what I've been seeing is that it really depends on how the destination starts reopening. I had that fear, for example, with the U.S. I said, okay, we're open now. The U.S. is our closest uh, source market. And um, right after that, the, the airlines uh, came aboard, you know, so we now we have not, not with the same frequency, maybe, but all of the major airlines coming with, with their flights uh, from the US. Europe has its restrictions. UK is another important source market for us, but the British are not really, you know, F the FCO advice is not really encouraging them to travel abroad. So, so with that, I think there are the limitations with the air, but definitely we depend a lot on them. I, I imagine Binky has a lot more intel because he's he has the global connections with all of the destinations. But, but
but it is definitely a concern. Uh, but at the same time, my experience with, with the country, country being reopened for the last uh, two months is that as soon as the country gives the conditions for people to, to start traveling back, you know, the, the, the business uh, starts flowing back. Yeah, if, if I can add to that, I think Jassy is spot on, right? On the countries that have opened already, for example, uh, like the East African countries, Kenya and Tanzania opened just uh, several months back. And, you know, right when they opened, you know, the, the Middle Eastern airlines, which a lot of us here in Manila are familiar with, you know, Qatar, Emirates, Etihad, you know, resumed flights back to those destinations. No? So, so actually, uh, for, for people in Manila, if you wanted to go to the Serengeti tomorrow, theory, you could, you could get on, on Qatar. The problem we have in the Philippines is our government is not allowing us to, to leave, no? Uh, but if you can get on Qatar, and you, you can get to, to Tanzania by tomorrow, you can get past their government not funding us to go somewhere. What about visas, um, Binky? Is uh, it easy to get visas now? Well, for countries that need visas, I think the process is still the same. But places like Kenya and Tanzania, it's visa on arrival, no quarantine requirements. So there are, there are places that, you know, theoretically one could go to. I, I, you know, for example, uh, South Africa right now, uh, you need, Filipinos need visas. The embassy is still not processing. But I think now that South Africa has announced their opening on the 1st of October, I see that uh, going to change fairly quickly. Yeah, well, it is affected. I actually, the, the reason why we did cancel this uh, two month trip is because Chile has uh, the border closed. So, with that, it's impossible. It's yeah. impossible to have people arriving to, to Santiago. And, and, and mm -hmm. traveler needs to fly from Santiago to Punta Arenas. So it's another three hours and a half flight. And, and those flights are not operating. So, uh, so that, that was the main reason. But um, apparently, it's, it's going to open. My, my niece uh, left Chile in September to go and study in the US. And, and she did it. I mean, I mean, I, I think what we need now is is to have this uh, this uh, flexibility, and and I think it's 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 going to start because uh, for us, for Chile, and and for all South America, actually, we're going to start. If not, these are the, the the starting months of our season. So. Patagonia, Argentina, Chile, Brazil, Ecuador, Peru. Most of the people travel in starting in October, November, December, January, February, and uh, at some point they will need to realize that we need those borders open so the the airline companies can fly. But then we have the the other problem, like in Philippines, that even though you want to travel, you cannot because the government don't allow you to go. So, yeah. No worry. Sorry. No worry. What about U.S. citizens? It seems that they're not welcome anywhere. <laughs> Where can they go? We have we have some U.S. citizens uh, among the audience who who want to know. <laughs> that's well. It, at at least for Ecuador, that's not at all the case. We're we're getting a lot of questions about which countries are allowed or not allowed into Ecuador. But but the truth is that this the system to get in it's is very simple. You you pretty much has to arrive with a with a PCR test, negative test, and you are free to to start traveling. So there are no no specifics on nationality. So. Uh, U.S., uh, Canadians, Europeans, you know, everybody's welcome. Yeah, Chile also. Uh, there, there is no restrictions for, for American citizens. Dave, how about in, in Southern Africa? Dave, I think there are no restrictions. Yeah. Yeah, unfortunately, there are restrictions. Um, <laughs> I think most of the Asian countries are okay to travel, um, but the, the governments here have not allowed the Americans in, which is a bit of a problem. That's our biggest source market. Um, so hopefully they get on top of that in the States sometime soon. 
but that it's it's the it's funny but it's in east africa it's actually the reverse where it's uh, you know there are a lot of americans into kenya and tanzania at the in the yeah. weird thing for now uh, in kenya well there filipinos are allowed into kenya but with a quarantine but americans can just skedaddle <laughs> along off the plane straight on safari so go figure yeah. <laughs> go figure yeah every country is is different um, I have a question here. What are the best places to go to in Ecuador if we only have a limited time of two weeks, including travel time from the Philippines? Jazz? Yeah, well, the beauty of, of our country is that it's so, mal, so small and so easy to get. You know, I tend to say that you can have breakfast in Quito, lunch in the Amazon rainforest, and you could even start with your dinner in the Galapagos. So that's how easy it is to move around. You know, the, the distances are incredibly short. You are 30 minutes flight away from any different corner of Ecuador mainland. So I would say that we could, you know, you can, you can put together easily, if, depending if you're a wildlife enthusiast, you, you will combine easily the Amazon rainforest with the Galapagos in two weeks time, including the, the, the time to get here. Or if you want to experience kind of the Andean landscape and cultures plus the Galapagos, that is definitely going to be a must uh, during your trip. Uh, we can also put it all in um, I will only say that Amazon, the Andes plus the Galapagos, probably within the two weeks we can do, but then you, you need your, your three to four days to, to go and come uh, from home. So I would say, but, but that's the beauty of, of, like I said in the beginning, right? The, 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 the essence of South America you have in Ecuador, so you can actually experience all of these different ecosystems in one very tiny, easy to move around country. What about um, Antarctica? How much time would you recommend for a trip to Antarctica? I mean, these are uh, all like once in a lifetime trips, right? For, for many people, so. I think you need to, you need to take it with, um, uh, with perspective. It is, uh, it's, it's, it's far to go to Antarctica. It is in take time, especially if you're coming from, from Philippines. So it's gonna be probably 24 hours to, to reach Punta Arenas. Um, uh, so you need around 15 days because when you go to Antarctica and, and, and you see that area and you understand uh, and you understand where you are in, in, in the planet, come back immediately home, it is could be a shock. I, I always suggest to to, to spend a few days, there is not necessarily doing more adventure, but maybe going to a winery. There is a bunch of properties close to Santiago uh, with great facilities and to spend time uh, in, next to the swimming pool with a glass of wine, looking those pictures and then go back home. Uh, because it's a powerful trip to go to Antarctica. And as I said, it's, it's, the, the, it's difficult to see it. I mean, uh, if I want to go to the Arctic now, right now, uh, I take a plane, I land in Norway, and in five hours later, I cross the, uh, the, the Arctic Circle. Mm. But if I want to go to cross the Antarctic Circle, it's going to take me uh, three weeks or more. So... Um, so you need to take it with, with time and at the end of the trip, do something that relax yourself because also there is, there is a temperature thing. Uh, we are in summer during your trip to Antarctica, but it's so cold in Antarctica that you always feel that you are in, in winter. And then when you go to Santiago or back to the continent, there is 34 degrees Celsius. So the contrast is quite uh, unique. So you, you need time. You need a buffer between Antarctica trip and, and home. And Dave, how, what, what's the minimum amount of time you recommend if you're going to any of your properties? Or do you <laughs> recommend, like, I'm sure Binky's done that. They've, they've jumped from one camp to another, right? Yeah, yeah. So we've got 20 different uh, camps, um, you know, different lodges. And normally people stay two to three nights at each place. And so it just really depends how much time you have. I mean, I, I think the, the shortest safari would be like a week. And literally the longest I think people have stayed with us is two months. But I think normally they're around about a week to sort of like 10 days maybe, wouldn't you say, um, Victor? 
yeah, that sounds about right. I think most people, you know, would go on safari, visit maybe three, four camps, and then spend about, yeah, 10, 12 days on safari. And then if they're in the southern part, you know, spend a little time in, in Cape Town, winding down after the safari. Mm -hmm. uh, just, uh, I know you've answered this, Dave, but I'll just read it out loud. We have a question from Christina Kepler asking about trips available early next year for Namibia, Botswana, and South Africa. And it will, you also have Tanzania. Yeah. And as you said, you have availability, right? So you said some lodges were already booked for the, the rest of the year. So, some are fully booked, but we do have space. Um, you know, we've got a lot of lodges, um, so we've got space. And, and as I've said, we don't operate in East Africa, Tanzania, but um, Asia to, uh, A2A can help you with, the, you know, good high quality guys up there. Yeah, so in, in yeah, Tanzania is, is open for in Q1. That's actually their low season. So it's actually a great time to go. Uh, you, you get good deals? Yes, the time quarter, quarter. yes. Yeah, great. And then I have a great question here from Alexia Cancio. Dave, you talked about how in June and July you opened your camp to domestic travelers. Yeah. Given that national, natural selection's audience is usually international, to what extent has domestic travel supported the financial sustainability of the business so far? I mean, we, we sort of talked about that, but if you want to go into more detail. Yeah, so, you know, so we rely on tourism to, to pay for the lodges, to pay for the families. The average employee we have, we have over 500 employees. The average employee looks up, up they care for up to eight to 10 people. So, you know, it, 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 there's a huge multiplier effect of, of when people don't have a job. Um, so we've kept on, um, the, you know, like 90% of our staff are still, are still there. Some are seasonal and we've had to let them go. But um, the local market has more than exceeded our expectations. Um, probably, as Jesse was saying, you know, they're, they're, they're busy in their, in their lodge. I think it was on the edge of that volcano, was it, um, Jesse? But, um, yeah, but, uh, it, 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 it's, it's been really amazing. And, and it shows you the pent up demand that there is. I mean, it surprised us. We didn't think because probably only five to 10 percent of our business is local South African, Namibian, Botswana, African um, nationals and residents. But it's been actually quite amazing, even though it's at a lot less rates. Um, we, we're delighted with the demand. Mm. And to the others, to Jassy and, and Juan Cristobal, are you also trying to attract more domestic travelers? Uh, it is, we, uh, it is, uh, oh, sorry. No, please, Juan. It, it, is, it is our, uh, it is one of our projects. Uh, uh, we know uh, in Chile, Antarctica, even though it's very close, it's not the most, um, uh, common destinations for them, but we we are trying to encourage people in Chile to to go to to Santiago and and basically also the risk for another reason is that um, we want to operate the season because uh, uh, we want to demonstrate also that uh, we can do it in completely safety. So, uh, uh, and that uh, with, with the rules and all the work we have been done with different organizations, cruise organizations, IATO, uh, local, uh, uh, local uh, hospitals and clinics and, and doctors, that we can do a completely safe um, uh, operation. So, uh, yes, fr from one side, yes, we want to do it because uh, we 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 need and we would like to have in a way that business. But also, it's because we have been working so hard in order to do it in a safety way that uh, that we want to to in a way test all that work because otherwise, for the future, we, we need to provide confidence. We need to provide. Uh, knowledge about what we are doing is the correct thing to do. Uh, starting from home, going back home, uh, assuring people that we can travel, we can go to Antarctica, we can go to Africa, we can go to Ecuador, we can go wherever we want based on, 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 on how your product, your DMC is able to give you confidence to do it. So, uh, yeah, 
I think we, we, we're good, definitely we're going to do it in Chile. I, I don't know if Chileans want to go to Antarctica. <laughs> That's the thing, but uh, we're going to try. Yes. Our experience with, with yeah, we, we are treating, we're seeing this from different perspectives, right? We, we, first of all, each business unit has a different type of clientele and way of being uh, used, right? So, for example, we have a small, um, very high-end restaurant in Quito, and that's, a, that's a, a business that we are not operating because people are not really still, we're still afraid of going out, you know, business travelers are not coming so that's something that we decided to push uh and postpone it reopening for you know later uh, next month um but going back to the lodge in, in in cotopaxi you know we felt like uh that's that's a business that is managed by my wife you know my wife and i decided that you know we had two priorities first of all we wanted to keep uh the jobs from from the locals who who operate the lodge and uh, so that was our priority. And, and we also felt like the locals were desperate to go out. And Cotopaxi is a place that is loved by the, by the Quiteños where, where I live, right? People we have, that's part of our postcard, is, 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 a, is a volcano that we see every single day. So we really love it and we go every weekend if we possibly can. So, so it's kind of a, a, our little uh, park outside the city. So we felt like we, we needed to reopen it for the locals because locals were asking us, we, we want to go, let me go, I can camp, I can camp on, on the property if you don't want to open the lodge. So we said, okay, let's reduce our rates to make it you know, accessible for everybody and make it a little bit more democratic. And we've been very surprised. You know, we are actually very thankful to the locals because they are the, really the ones now keeping us uh, going, uh, sustaining those jobs. We're not leaking it looking at the bottom line in terms of profit at all. We are just thinking that we need to sustain that operation and keep those jobs going and having the locals to enjoy that place because in, in, in common, you know, in, in a common situation, it's usually packed with, with international travelers. So in a way it's interesting to allow locals to enjoy places that usually international travelers are the ones only enjoying it. I saw something recently, Dave, I think it was in Business Day, South Africa, one of the newspapers saying that all of a sudden now the lodges are trying to court, you know, black, the, you know, lo um, local population, meaning, you know, black um, residents trying and as inviting them now, making it more kind of um, enticing for them to go to the bush lodges because they're generally not the target clientele, right? Yeah, yeah, um, it's true, you know, and um, as Jesse was saying, a lot of these lodges are out of, um, out out of, of the pr price range. Mm. And now, now we've opened it up and I think we're gonna continue to open it up um, in future with, with, you know, sort of good last minute deals for locals um, and hopefully keep them coming for the future as well. Yeah. Um, Juan Cristobal, I have a very nice comment from someone who didn't leave his or her name yeah. saying, did you see that? They were with Antarctica 21 this year, had an amazing time, no crowds, service from our very own Kababayans. I guess you have Filipino um, crew there and saying it was very, it was impeccable and it was quite an experience. So it must be nice to hear. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much because it's all, all, always good to you know, the, the best ambassador at the end are our travelers. So when, 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 the la when you read the last sentence, it's, 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 uh, it feels nice. And the job is done and it was done very well. So, and, uh, and here we're going to be for, for the next year too. So that's, um, yeah. Let's, and uh, then I have someone from Spain, um, Lynn's Bolton. Uh, she's tuning in from Valencia, and actually you're in Spain as well. How would she get to Antarctica from from Valencia? Uh, I think you have two two ways. Uh, uh, the best, the quick way, uh, it is via Madrid. You fly from Valencia to Madrid. Madrid, uh, I recommend LATAM always to, to travel to South America, to Chile. Um, 
you arrive to Santiago, you spend one or two nights in Santiago, depending on, on, on your, your wishes, but uh, otherwise you can connect directly to Punta Arenas. Um, then uh, if you have time, you can go and, and, and go to, to the National Park, Toros del Paine National Park, or, or going directly with us. We're gonna be waiting you at the airport and then your, your journey starts there. You do your eight days with us, and then we leave it to you at the airport. You fly back to Santiago and back to Punta Ebu, to Madrid and back to Valencia, but via Madrid. There is a flight also via uh, Barcelona, uh, but that flight is operate with this new company called uh, Aval or Avant. It's daily flight. Um, and it's direct to Santiago de Chile, which is also a very good uh, combination. I prefer to fly with LATAM, more, more, more reliable in, in timing and, and all the rest. Great. That's great. <clears throat> My voice. Um, that's great. That's great hearing from all of you. I wanted to say before we close, um, elevator pitch, the three of you, or even you, Binky. <laughs> Why, why should they go to your property? What's the best thing about it? You know, um, when they plan to travel again, why go to your place? What's, you know, how, how do you reel them in? Your best pitch. You want to see who wants to start? Uh, I, I will start. I, I think right, right, right now, uh, uh, leaving those times, I think uh, nearly I want to say that most than a destination today is is not to have fear to travel not to have feel to dream about uh, going somewhere um i am personally going to to nepal in october if i can because the borders are open there and and i want to do this annapurna and i remember that the guy i contact there told me Listen, it's a great time to come here because uh, there's going to be nobody. <laughs> so you can do your trekking and, and suddenly I say, no, it cannot be nobody. We need to go there. We need to go to places. So uh, we, need to, we need to have the idea to travel. Travelers are travelers and, and planes are made to fly and vessels are made to sail and we need to use it. So, so let's go to everywhere in the world. Uh, it's uh, it's important to not lose that idea. Uh, then, if you if you if you want to reach a, 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 another planet, uh, you should come to Antarctica because uh, it is quite a place. It's it's not uh, uh, somebody. We all, we always said that uh, Antarctica is a one life uh, trip in, in, or experience. Uh, and it's true the first time you go, but then when you go there, you want to go again and again and again. And, and, and I would love to have this, this thing that Africa has so, so rich that people say, no, I've been there five times. And, and in our case, they say, no, I've been there one time. And, but it, it is sort of like a jewel. So make Antarctica your jewel to keep it, your memories. It's going to be a fantastic trip. So. Oh, that's nice. Oh. I want to go now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Binky, yeah. <laughs> let's arrange it. Yeah. What, Beep? Um, thanks. I, I just want to say I've personally been to Antarctica and Ecuador and I would love to go back. I mean, I definitely, it's one of those, those two places that are just incredible, um, beautiful natural history uh, areas. And uh, I know I, I, I'm actually watching the presentations. I want to go right now, but I can't give that pitch because I want to talk about our own as well. <laughs> but um, I, I guess our... Um, you know, our, 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 our collective um, offerings are, they're, they're, they're not things that you're going to risk your life doing. You know, we're going to make it safe for you. I think um, we're providing a, a great variety of activities. Um, we've got, we have a very light footprint where we operate. We, we, we're pretty well all on solar. We've got all the, we've got a very small footprint on the environment, a variety of activities. Um, so, so, you know, it's not just all about wildlife, it's about food, it's about culture as well. Um, 
And, you know, for us, we, we're lucky to be operating in a desert. Um, I think it's, it's pretty safe to travel uh, anywhere um, in, the, in the adventure travel world because you're actually out in the open and you're dining usually in the open and you've got chalets that are far apart from each other that we're naturally socially distanced. So, you know, so I think all three, I can't, I can't really... I mean, I love all three destinations. So, I, I, I mean, I'm hoping that all your guests think you'll come to all three of us in the next few years. Thanks, Dave. Yeah, yeah I, I think that's, that's it. I think, I think the pitch here is really about what's going to be first, right? And, and I think that mass tourism and more like urban adventures are not going to be the way to go in the near future. I think adventure travel off the beaten path, uh, natural destinations like ours, it's uh, are going to be very popular. And the truth is that even though Galapagos sounds like you know a very known name around the world, it's a very small destination with very very low volumes. And uh, and and for us, it's a dream because we've been talking about ecotourism, uh, mega diversity, and meaningful experiences for 20 years. And um, in the early days, people thought we were crazy about doing community tourism. And I think that now, you know, the pitch is like people, that's what people are desperate to have, you know, meaningful experiences, learning about new cultures, uh, being in the outdoors, uh, enjoying the wildlife, landscapes and, and unique nature. So yeah, and Ecuador has it all. So what can I say, you know, this is, this is the perfect time for us. And I think that's the pitch, you know, we, we have, everything that uh, any adventure traveler uh, it's, uh, is ready to, to, to experience. Thanks, Jassy. I guess just, just to wrap up and summarize what my colleague said, I guess you know, in this pandemic, I've come up on a couple of webinars, TV interviews, and they often get asked, what are you doing differently during the pandemic? No? And you know, I, I answer that, you know, it's, it's funny for us, for A to A, uh, from our inception, we really focused on these uh, special, unique, uh, adventurous places all over the world, Africa, South America, and working with very, you know, small conservation-oriented properties like the three of our colleagues here, you know, and, and putting all of that together to create a truly special and meaningful experience, travel experience for our clients. And it's funny now that after having COVID for you know, six or eight months, those are, and, and most people being locked in literally into their homes, that's exactly what people are looking for now and will look for after COVID, where I think upon reflection, you look back on your life, you say, you know, what have I been doing? What have I done in my life? And you realize these experiences are really, if you've been fortunate enough to have these experiences in the past, it makes you treasure them and value them even more, want to do more of those. And, and with the advent of COVID, the increased emphasis on exclusivity, privacy, social distancing. Again, all of the properties and companies who were, have had that since day one. So it's, all, it's really just going back to basics. So I think the message really for the audience and your members here is that you know, if, if you have the wherewithal and the courage to travel, I think these the destinations we work with, uh, the sampling of these three of these three areas, are exactly the kinds of places you would want to go to. You know, even now, because I think realistically, COVID is not going to go away anytime soon. We have to learn to live with it. And if you are yearning to travel, these are the exact kind of places that you should be traveling to. And and we're here to to help make it happen. To answer your questions, as you've heard, there's a lot of things to navigate even before there was a lot of navigation to do and even now there's even more navigation but we're here to help guide you and hold your hand and still create an you know a unique and special experience for you even during this time and also i think i'd like to say like the conservation aspect i think is very important and binky that says a lot about the partners you choose to engage with right that's very important i think also with the origins of the zoonotic origins of of the coronavirus of COVID-19, I think you want to also go to a place where you know that the likelihood of animal to human transmission is almost zero, right? Because of the conservation efforts, respect for the wildlife and all that, right? Yes, I think that, that's, that's very true, Bambina. Every, especially here, in, you know, it just so happened our panelists are all 
come from you know areas that have unique sort of flora and fauna and then you you know i'm fortunate enough to be to all of them and you will see really that you know their guides you know really impart that knowledge and respect for the environment and uh, bring them forth that conservation ethos to the clients well, I'd like to thank all of you for joining us today, if there are no other questions. Um, and uh, Manila House members, thank you for being with us today. I just want to remind you to please come to the club. Um, we're open and we've got a new bar in the main dining area and um, also the outside area, although I think it's, it's, it's a bit of a drizzle today. But we'd love to see you back there, safely social distanced and um, with all the, um, all the safety protocols in place. I'd like to thank um, Jassy, Juan Cristobal, and um, Dave, and especially Binky for, for making this all happen. So thank you for a very interesting afternoon. And I'm sure a lot of people are already, you know, plotting their trips for next year as soon as you reopen, as soon as, soon as we're able to travel, I think. Thank you. I mean, everybody said that these are all bucket list locations that they'd all love to go to at least once in their lifetimes. So thank you very much for joining us. The video will be up in a day or so on our YouTube channel, Manila House, uh, Manila House Private Members Club on YouTube. Thank you. And right. you know how to reach Binky. Binky, you just wanna like just quick um, email address? Yeah, I, I guess for us, the fastest way if you wanna get in touch with A2A is uh, just go to our website, which is www.a2asafaris.com. And uh, you can just hit inquiry on our contact page and uh, we'll get back to you uh, on any questions you may have. Okay, great. Thank you, everyone. Um, Jassy, Thank please you. go back to sleep. I know it's very late for you. And um, to Juan Cristobal and Dave, have a nice rest of the day. And everyone else, have a nice evening. Thank you so much for joining us. See you for the next webinar. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Bye, bye. Bye. Have a good Thank day. You. Good night. Thanks. Good evening. Thank you. Okay. Bye. I'll send you Bink I'll send you guys the link to the video when it comes out. Cheers. Okay. Bye.